Hi there folks, Spencer Rempel, the Moose Whisperer here, bringing you exciting outdoor adventure and hunting stories from around the world. And today's story is coming to you from South Central British Columbia, Canada, the Kootenays, the Selkirk Mountains to be exact. Today's story was submitted by my good friend, lifetime hunting partner, Ash. And you know what? If you stick through to the end, I'm going to tell you more about him and the others that are in this story as well. But for now, let's get straight to the story. This is a wonderful elk hunting story. So, the trip took place in the early 90s, when the elk population in the West Kootenays was at its finest. The hunt began on a beautiful, crisp fall day, the beginning of October, if I remember right. I was a young teen and my dad and my uncle Harv in their 40s. We headed out to try and harvest an elk. We made our way up winding, narrow logging roads typical of the Kootenays with potholes and bumps bouncing us around. When we finally arrived, we unloaded our ATV as well as a couple of dirt bikes and headed far into the mountains as we could go. We had a special place in mind that allowed you to get to an area where there were perfect open slides with alpine above. Oh, this is elky country, I said, and we parked those bikes and started hiking up an old skid trail. We had an elk bugle, but back in those days, elk bugles looked a lot different than they do now, let me tell you. Now, there's all sorts of different brands and styles. There are reeds that can mimic young bulls, old bulls, as well as cows and calves. Back then, there were reeds, but they were very hard to get a consistent sound out of. I think they had just been invented, and my dad had an old metal whistle call that looked like a small wind, wind instrument, kind of like a mini tuba without the bell. And it sounded like a cheap recorder we used to get in music class back in elementary school. <laughs> It didn't get the deep sound, but you could get a really good top-end squeal through it. And, you know, if the elk were heavy in the rut, then it usually worked. Okay, so we hiked our way along, keeping track of the wind and looking for the perfect spot to bugle from. We made it up to a vantage point that we could see across some open areas towards the slides. This country is absolutely amazing and hard to express the beauty of it in words. We were probably up around 7 or 8,000 feet in the Selkirk Mountains that are just slightly smaller, but completely resemble the Rocky Mountains. At that elevation, the trees are smaller and open up to some meadows and fresh growing avalanche snow slides. The first bugle was let out and we sat and patiently waited. When you're up in the high country, it's amazing how sound travels. We let out a few more bugles and sure enough, way off in the distance, we heard a faint bugle. I was getting excited. There is nothing that beats the sound of an elk bugle. Moose and deer sure didn't develop a very majestic sound and don't even compare. It's on its way, I said to my dad and uncle. Over the next half hour, that elk worked its way down the mountain and the whole while getting more and more riled up. It was so exciting to hear that bugle get louder and louder as it made its way in. We were all set up, hunkered down with a nice gun rest, but sure enough, like a lot of bulls do, this one hung up, just out of our sight, right at the edge of the bush. It started raking the trees with its antlers and wouldn't come a step closer. You could see the trees moving, but you couldn't see the elk. At that point, my dad moved down below us and grabbed a big stick and started scratching and hitting a tree with it. <laughs> While I was thinking, what the heck is he doing? Shouldn't we be as quiet as we can so as not to spook the elk? But my dad knew, he knew that cagey elk needed more encouragement and more proof that there was a rival bull elk in his area. The bugle wasn't enough. He wanted to see and hear, hear the bush and the trees being raked by antlers. Well, my dad didn't have any antlers, but he knew a stick would do. And sure enough, that got the elk to step out. He stepped right out into the open, gave a beautiful call and started heading straight towards us. This was one of the most majestic things I've ever seen in my life. Now, this was a nice mature bull with a lot of tines. Uncle Harv was ready. With a perfect rest, I heard him let out his breath and squeeze the trigger. Boom! One shot is all it took as Uncle Harv put a really good shot into that elk. It ran only a few meters and went down. Well, that was pretty darn exciting. This was a nice bull. We waited a while for him to pass peacefully and made our way over to where he lay. Well, wouldn't you know it, he had somehow managed to roll down a big depression like, and land in a stump hole as we were in a previously logged area. 
it was going to be very awkward and very difficult place to field dress him and get him out of. So, you might be saying, hey, that's not a bad story, but what the heck, guys? A lot, of, a lot of people bugle in an elk and, you know, have to field dress it or get it out of a rough spot. But it's this next part that is a very rare occurrence and starting to get scary. Now, I only had my trusted 3030 with me because I was a pretty young back then, and it was a perfect deer gun for me in the thick bush of the Kootenays. Since the bull was down in this hole, it was my job to be our lookout in case we had any visitors that we didn't want, uh, like grizzly bears. <laughs> And sure enough, a few minutes later, there was a mighty crashing in the nearby bush line. Well, no, wait a minute, maybe it's another bull coming in. No. Out of that crashing bush came a bear. He stood up on his hind legs, sniffing the air, and it was easy to see it was a large silver tip grizzly. It had a head on it, and it, it was sniffing the air, and I let the guys know we had a visitor, and he did not look happy. In fact, I think he looked hungry. <laughs> My dad came up and switched guns with me, saying his 7mm Magnum was a better fit. <laughs> Watch our backs, he told me, <laughs> and that is what I did, although I was feeling a little nervous. But not as nervous as I was about to feel, for believe it or not, suddenly there was more crashing in the bush to the other side. Okay, well, maybe this time it's an elk coming in from the calls we made earlier. But once again, no. It was another silver tip grizzly coming in from the smell of the dead elk or the sound of the rifle shot. You know, it's, it's debated that if a grizzly hears a boom and then comes across an elk carcass, how many times does that need to happen before he puts two and two together and hears a gunshot as a dinner bell? Anyways, back to our story. The second grizzly was even bigger than the first. A real brute, let me tell you. I've seen a lot of grizzlies and this thing was massive. His nose told him exactly where we were and he was staring straight at us. Both bears started walking back and forth, not coming closer, but pacing and clicking their teeth together. <laughs> if you've ever had two big grizzlies staring at you, chomping their teeth together, well, it's a nerve wracking experience, let me tell you. So that's when we said, there is no way we can stay here. So Uncle Harv headed back down to get his quad. We figured if we could get his quad close, we could hook onto the elk and skid it out of there and hopefully speed up the process. So while he was gone, we guarded that elk. Those grizzly bears had a natural fear of us humans, but the smell of elk blood was making them braver and braver. They came closer, continuing with their scare tactics of chomping their teeth together. And in fact, that was working really well because I was starting to get very scared. We blasted off a few shots with our rifles into the air, and that kept them from coming any closer, but we knew we didn't have long. You see, in Canada, it's the law that you're not allowed to use any harmful means to protect your meat from a bear. If the bear runs you off the carcass, then you run off the carcass. You are not allowed to shoot or injure the bear in any way. Okay, back to the story. When the quad arrived with very considerable effort, we got it in close to the moose just as the bears were starting to circle around and act even more aggressive. We threw a winch cable down in the hole, hooked onto the elk, and I don't know if it was willpower, prayer, or a miracle, but that little quad yanked that elk right out of the hole without even stopping for a second. My dad and I jumped on the quad and said, go, just go, 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 go. <laughs> So in, in one swift movement, we pulled that elk right out of the hole and all the way down to the truck as the grizzlies came in to eat the guts. It was a real good example of why you have to be careful when hunting and how amazing it is to have two mountain men with you. As nervous as I was, I knew I had two of the best, most experienced hunters in the Kootenays with me. And that elk ended up being a 7x8. It was an older elk, no longer in his prime, and his antlers were starting to go smaller. But the meat on that elk filled our freezers. That rack is still hanging in my uncle's shop. It's another reminder of how antlers or the hides of animals may appear to others to be just a trophy. You know, you got some, just a trophy hanging there. But in fact, when I look back at that rack, I remember what it represents. It represents the time we had together, the reminder of a shared adventure, a reminder of how strong my elderly dad used to be. How much Uncle Harv was such a great, knowledgeable guy, may he rest in peace. And I'll never forget our adventures and how hunting brought us together. You know, I'd really like to thank Ash for sending that story in to me. 
As promised, I want to tell you a little bit more about the author of this story. His name is Ash Rempel, and he grew up in Hauser, British Columbia, as a bush kid. You know, here's a picture of him here. <laughs> I got a few more. Check out these. Yeah, he was a bush kid. He grew up just the way I grew up. We just lived out in the middle of nowhere. And there was, you know, there was nothing around. A couple of a couple of neighbors. There was one one elementary school, one little, uh, one little general store. And you know what? That would have been about ten miles away from Ash's place. This guy grew up in the bush from when he was a little kid, to when he was just catching frogs, to catching mice, to catching squirrels, to hunting, to hunting elk, to trapping marten and wolverine. This guy knows the bush like you wouldn't believe. He's the real deal, and we actually went, uh, we actually got to guide together on a moose hunting guide before, which was a fabulous trip, and more stories to come from that. All right. What's so exciting about this story is I know the area well. It's talking about where I grew up as well. And the other two characters in this story is his dad, uh, Ray Rempel. All right. That would be my uncle, in fact. And the other character was who he called Uncle Harv. Well, that was my dad and uh, may he rest in peace. So this story was just a beautiful story for me. You know what? Ash relayed it to me and I was listening to it and I'm like, okay, well there you guys, where was I? Why was I not there? But I did the math on it and I think at that time in my life I was more interested in, in hunting girls than elk. So I wasn't there and I missed out on this one. <laughs> Which is too bad, but it sure brings back good memories of other hunts and other times when I got to hunt with these two wonderful men these two men in our lives, like, it's hard to explain for Ash and me. That was his dad and my dad, and they spent, a, they were best friends. So I knew his dad so well, I knew my dad so well, and vice versa for him. And these were the two, he called them mountain men, and they really were. These guys were the real deal. They were homesteaders. They could fix and do anything. They could hunt and trap anything. It's where we learned a lot of our skills from and where we got such a, um, a respect for the, that type of person and for that lifestyle and really what encouraged us to want to be like that as well. Thanks, Ash, for sending that story. I just can't say enough good about that. Just wonderful. Folks, you got stories out there. You went hunting with your dad. You went hunting with your uncle, with your family. Let us know. Let me know. Send in your stories to info at themoosewhisperer.com. You know what? You can type them out for me. Or if you want, you can just hit the voice record on your phone and you can just set, tell out your story. Man, this one time I was hunting elk. You wouldn't believe it. And then at the end, you just hit share on there and you can share it to info at themoosewhisperer.com. Thanks for watching, folks. More stories to come. <laughs>